anyone who cares should be all over this. This is what our listeners say. Recorded in Hong Kong and presented by Regina Larco. Yeah, that's me. Hashtag Impact Podcast interviews people making a social impact with their work. Our show wants to raise awareness for our guests' work with impact by giving them a platform to share their inspiring stories. From rooftops to cafes, from co-working spaces to a former army base. The places where we record represent the noise and contrasts of busy and buzzing Hong Kong. A place most of Hashtag Impact Podcast guests call home. Real, honest and fun. Our conversations with these brilliant change makers will show you how you can make your own impact. Find us on iTunes, Spotify, Android and pretty much all podcast apps that are out there. Or simply head over to hashtagimpact.com to listen online and find lots of bonus material as well as fun looks behind the scenes. Come back often and if you like what you're hearing at Hashtag Impact Podcast, please tell your friends about it. Talk to you soon. Kong Confidential. I'm Jules Hannaford and I'm your host. I'm an Australian woman and I've been living in Hong Kong for many years. I'm a mother, a teacher, an author, and I want to share my wisdom and the wisdom of others with you. Thanks for joining me and I hope you enjoy the show. Kong Confidential is brought to you by Teresa's Turkish Towels. Teresa imports the finest 100% Turkish cotton towels that dry very quickly, making them perfect for Hong Kong's humid climate. Say goodbye to the traditional smelly and stinky towels and try the colourful and fresh selections available online or in Teresa's Wan Chai store. Use the promo code CONFIDENTIAL online or mention this podcast when you visit in person to receive a hundred dollars off your entire order when you order two or more towels with a hundred percent satisfaction guaranteed or your money back the only thing you've got to lose are the musty smells that permeate traditional terry towels visit www.hkturkish.com in order to get the address and directions to Teresa's semi-hidden location Today I'm here with Sally. Hi, Sally. Thanks for joining me today. Hi. Thanks for having me. Sally, can you tell me a little bit about yourself as a young child? What were you like? As a young child, I remember always feeling different. I thought that I was like maybe going to be this undiscovered actress or, you know, I had fantasies of I was going to be, I always thought I was going to be someone famous or really important and you know, I was into singing and dancing and all of that kind of stuff like normal children are. But I always remember thinking that no one else was aware of things like I was aware of things or I don't know. I just always kind of felt that everyone knew something that I didn't and I didn't get this like handbook to life and everyone just kind of knew what was going on and I didn't. And I was always kind of trying to just follow along with the rest of the crowd and what everyone else was doing, <laughs> but also feeling very special and different on the inside. I think my mother used to always tell me that I was the best at stuff and my parents would always praise me for being really smart and clever and pretty and all of these things. But I still felt like something in me was different from my peers. I don't know. That's really interesting. And did you have a happy childhood? Yeah, I had a really happy childhood, I would say. My parents were middle class. We weren't super rich. We weren't poor. We did well. I was born in Hong Kong and we moved to the UK. And so I grew up in the UK until I was about eight, which was when we first moved and we moved to the Philippines to be closer to my mom's family. And then I have an older sister and she was having sort of, you know, teenage rebellion issues. And we moved to Hong Kong where my dad was working at the time to be closer to him and to be a family unit again. And that's kind of where it all kind of turned a bit rocky. And do you know why it went rocky then? <laughs> I think it was mainly that my sister was a teenager and she was acting out and my dad came from a military background and he started 
you know, being very strict and not that he wasn't strict before, but now it was very extreme strictness. And my mom didn't know how to handle my sister. And I must have been about eight, nine, 10 at the time. So I was still in primary school. And I remember that my sister had run away and she was one of my best friends. And I really looked up to her. And from that point, I kind of knew there was something different about because no one else's brothers or sisters were running away. So I thought there was something wrong with our family. And I just kind of remember looking at the relationship between my parents and my sister and always thinking, well, I'm not going to get into fights with my parents. So I'm just going to shut down and I'm not going to fight with them. And I'm going to be really well behaved. I'm going to be a good girl. And what age was this at? I think it must have been around 10 or 11. Because my sister must have been about 14 or 15. So I must have been about 10. And it's really bizarre because I remember making the decision at about 12 that I wanted to be cool. It was like puberty hit. Then just something in me switched. I just wanted to wear makeup and smoke cigarettes and hang out with the cool kids. And all of that kind of stuff. When did your addictions really begin? Is that how they began with starting smoking cigarettes and hanging out with the cool kids? I would say it happened even before then with eating. I wouldn't say today that I have disordered eating, but definitely at that really young age, sort of eight, nine, 10, I had disordered eating. It was when we'd moved from the UK to the Philippines and I just started controlling what I was eating. And I didn't realize that it was a problem until a bit later, years later, when I loved when people would call me skinny or they would comment on how slim I was and how beautiful that was. I think that was sort of the first time where I could manipulate something in my favor. Right. And And so you started restricting with your food. Yes. Yeah. And then it was self-harm. I was about 12, I think, the first time I would self-harm. I would cut my wrists and things like that. And I didn't want to die. That wasn't the point of it. I felt like I had no release other than this physical release of pain. Where did this pain come from, this inner pain? Where did it stem from? I'm not quite sure. I think a lot of the time having very strict parents There wasn't a lot of emotional talk at home. You know, we didn't talk about how we felt. We just kind of swept things under the rug or my dad and my sister would get into an argument or my mom and my sister would get into an argument or I would do something naughty and annoy my dad and we would just kind of sweep it under the rug until everyone pretended that everything was fine again. So I never grew up learning how to talk about how I was feeling. The self-harm became a coping mechanism. Oh, yeah, definitely. It was definitely a coping mechanism. How were you aware of self-harm? Like, did you learn about it somewhere? Did you see others doing it? Or is it just something that you instinctively did? There was this movie that was out around the same time that all of these behaviors started happening about two young girls who were teenagers who were going out and partying and all that kind of stuff. And I kind of looked at that movie and I was like, that's cool. And one of the girls was self-harming and they were taking tabs of acid and they were getting their tongues pierced and their bellies pierced and hanging around with boys. And that's kind of what I defined as cool. Was this a huge influence on you then, this movie? Like, do you give it some... I was obsessed with it. I loved watching it. Wow. And I... Do you place some blame on some of your choices and behavior on that movie? No, because I think that I would have gone down this sort of path anyway. I think there were enough influences. I wanted attention, but I didn't want good attention for doing good things. I wanted, I don't know what I wanted. (laughs) I don't know what I wanted, but I, I wanted to live. I just wanted to be happy, I think. And And you were searching for ways to be happy. Yeah. And sort of mood altering, mind altering substances, you know, smoking, they say, oh, it relaxes you. And well, first of all, how long were you doing the um, self-harming? In the grand scheme of things, it wasn't actually that long. It was about two years from about 12 to 14. 
But I really remember that people looked down on the cutting and the self-harm. And a lot of my friends would, they'd be like, don't do that. Why are you doing that? You're so stupid, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't like that negative feedback from my peers. I wanted to be liked. I'm a big people pleaser. I wanted to be liked by people. And I actively made a choice. The next time that I feel like cutting myself, feel like cutting myself, I'm going to smoke a cigarette instead, which probably isn't (laughs) the best advice to give someone. (laughs) But I needed to change that outlook and that behavior. And I don't think I even liked doing it, but I just didn't know what else to to do. do. And I guess you had to find something to replace that addiction because self-harm can become addictive, can't it? I think it's extremely addictive because it is that instant gratification. And I remember... And what is that gratification? Is it pain? Is it a release? Is it punishing yourself? I think it was more of a release. And then it becomes sort of like this ritual, you know, of hiding or crying and then taking the utensil or whatever out from wherever I've hidden it and then cutting. And yeah, it's been so long though since I've self-harmed that yeah, it's hard to perhaps remember what yeah, you felt. Yeah, but it was sort of like the food and the self-harm and then it went into drugs and alcohol. Okay. Tell me about the beginning of the drug and alcohol behaviors. I was just a 12-year-old. That is really young. and It's so young. None of my school friends were a part of this. It was sort of I was hanging out with older kids from different schools and they'd all go smoke cigarettes on you know, in an alleyway or on a rooftop or something like that in a park. And whoever was the oldest would, or who looked the oldest, would go get cheap cans of beer from the shop or whatever, or whoever would sell us alcohol. And that kind of became it. And I mean, I was 12. I had no tolerance. I would have a few sips of something and I'd be pissed drunk. But (laughs) I always kind of feel like I never really liked alcohol as well because I did become very emotional and I would cry and I would get messy and I would do things. And then I'd wake up the next morning regretting it. And feel terrible. And feel terrible. But I liked hanging out with those people. And did you need to feel like you belonged? Absolutely. Absolutely. And is that part of why you've sort of started with these behaviors to belong to this group? Yes, absolutely. And then that kind of then progressed to someone had weed when I was about 13. And that was the first time I smoked weed. Well, actually, it was hash. I smoked hash. And then that's when things for me changed. And I liked the effect of that over the alcohol. Because with that, I felt fun and light and happy. And I didn't feel messy. Yeah, you don't lose control on pot or hash like you do on alcohol, do you? No. And that was the whole thing was that I hated being out of control. And it eventually became a habit. By the time I was 14, it wasn't just doing it on the weekends with my friends. I was picking up drugs by myself and going and smoking by myself. And I became extremely manipulative. I would only... I smoke with other people, but I wanted to keep most of it for myself. So I'd hide it or I would, well, actually I just became really isolated and I only wanted to smoke by myself unless I didn't have any money. And then I would meet up with other people to smoke. I never used drugs socially. I always used drugs to just not be sober and not be in reality because for me, I didn't like who I was in reality. I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. And all around the same time, I still have this kind of underlying eating disorder. And I eventually was exposed to crystal meth, which at the time we were calling ice. But yeah, there was a big ice sort of epidemic where it was really cheap. And the people that I was hanging out with had kind of upgraded from weed and pills to ice, which was really cheap. And we were kids, we were teenagers. And did you know what ice was and how dangerous it was at the time? I did actually. I had seen movies and people had talked about it, but it wasn't the phenomenon in the media, things like Breaking Bad and Narcos and things like that. 
it was kind of synonymous with crack and the people who I was hanging out with at the time were hanging out with older men who had a lot of money and they kind of played it off as this party drug. And then it stopped being this party drug and it became a way to concentrate on my work, a way to lose weight because you stay awake for days on end without eating. And I just became extremely paranoid and extremely isolated. And I would be up for days on end researching about this drug to make sure that I couldn't get addicted to it, you know? And it was when you so, were already addicted. Yeah. It was How old were you at this point? 14, yes. That's so young. 14 That's crazy. going on 15. Wow. And yeah. how did this affect your social life, your school, your family relationships? Well, no one at school knew that I was using meth because that is like the step up. It wasn't this cool thing to be doing. And all the people sort of in my year group had just started smoking cigarettes and just started drinking in the park and things like that. So for me, this behavior had to be a secret. I was barely speaking to my parents at this point. I would ask them for money. And if I didn't have money, I would ask them for money. And that was it. We didn't do things together. We didn't spend family time together. It was like, go home, do your work and your parents keep to themselves and I kept to myself. And did they think this was normal teenage behavior or did they know something was going wrong? I mean, I think you'd have to ask them, but they must have known something was going on. But because things had been so strained with their relationship with my sister, who was always lashing out, and then there was me who was just not reacting or shutting myself away. So I don't know if they just thought it was their parenting or, yeah, but they must have known. And I remember going into school. This was before the meth had gotten really bad. This was me when I was sort of smoking weed every single day. And I came into school and one of my teachers took me in and she said, right, we are going to give you the summer basically to get sober. And when you get back from summer, we're going to drug test you because they had heard through the grapevine that I was using. Um, Just weed, yeah? Or was it alcohol and weed? I think they had heard that I was using ecstasy, which was probably true at the time. Right. But I had downgraded it to I had tried weed once or twice, as you do when you want to protect your addiction. And did, that's what I was doing. Did your teacher believe that? Of course not. <laughs> she, she probably knew better. But yeah, just looking back on it, I wasn't that smart, but I thought I was being really smart. And I was just trying to manipulate everyone and everything around me so that I could keep using. So I downgraded my weed addiction to it. I've tried it every now and then. And really, I was going in for ecstasy, right? In my mind, I've researched how long does it take for drugs to stay in your system. So I said to myself, right, there's two months of summer. That's about eight weeks. So for the first four weeks, I'm going to smoke every single day. I'm going to smoke weed every single day. And then I'm going to use ice whenever I can. And then once I hit that four week mark, I'm going to take all the drugs out and I'm only going to drink. I'm only going to drink. How did that go? Was, were you able to stop the drugs? I was able to replace the drugs with alcohol and cigarettes, but I wasn't happy about it because in my mind, I wasn't trying to get sober to get sober. I was trying to pass a drug test. Right. And the meth had gotten to become almost daily as well as the weed. So with the meth, it had a physical hold on me in the sense that once I was offered it, I really had no choice at that point. In my mind, my addiction would somehow turn it into I had to use. So I remember it was the day before school was about to start. And this group of children said, hey, we're going to go pick up meth. And in my mind, I told myself, They've forgotten about the drug test. The teacher doesn't know that this is going to happen. Of course, they won't drug test me tomorrow. And I went and I smoked and then I went home and I stayed up the whole night and I put my school uniform on in the morning. You know, I was still high. I had lost about 10 kilos. I walked into school and I was about 
35 kilograms, which is so low. It's like 70 or 80 pounds. It's ridiculous. And I remember, you know, wanting to stop, but not being able to, not knowing how, not having the tools, not having friends around me who were supportive because they weren't addicted to drugs like I was addicted to drugs. And they didn't need it the same way I needed it. Because I had the one group of friends who just kind of smoked and drank and occasionally smoked weed. And I had the other group of friends, the secret group of friends that did meth. And that was really difficult, trying to please all these different groups and also try and please myself. And I didn't know how, you know, I was just so soulless and so empty and so devoid of anything. And I had depression. I was just so sad all the time, you know, and I really hated myself and I wasn't comfortable in my own skin and I was just trying to fix it. So was the depression brought on by your addictions, do you think? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And so what happened when you got back to school really, really low weight? Oh, my teacher took one look at me and said, right, in my office. And I just broke down crying. I remember just breaking down crying and asking for help. You know, I wanted to get sober, but I didn't know how. And I hated the way I felt. They called my parents in and that was scary too because my parents and I hadn't spoken really and it was amazing because at the time in Hong Kong there was a recovery center but they didn't have any inpatient treatment centers for under 18s and I was 15 at the time so they organized for me to go to South Africa to a treatment center there because they said I needed inpatient treatment I would not work with an outpatient program. I needed to be monitored. I needed to be away from drugs. I needed to be away from triggers. And is that because your addictions were so strong? Yes. Yeah, Mm. I think so. What was your parents' reaction? I think they were just really relieved that it was all out and that there was a solution. It's so bizarre because something so terrible and so traumatic actually brought our whole family together. And we did family therapy. We were talking about things. They say that an addiction is a family disease. So just because I got better, it didn't mean that everyone in my family was fixed. I came back from treatment after six weeks, started school again. And it was the first time I'd been sober in a couple of years, you know, at such a young age. And really sober because there was this realization in treatment that I'm not just in here to stop using meth. I'm here to get clean and sober completely. Right. Because for me, there is no only alcohol or only meth or only weed. It's all or nothing. Which is common with many addicts who go into treatment. They've got to stop everything, don't they? Everything. Before we go on more to treatment, can I just go back to school? So your teacher thought you were just smoking a little bit of pot. That's what she thought. Yes. So how did it all come out that there was meth and ecstasy and everything involved in the severity of it? Do you know? Do you remember? I think I admitted everything in the end. (laughs) I think I did. I think I was just done with all the lies. And that's when they realized that this is mega serious and you've got to get parents in. And so your parents were aware of all the different drugs. Is that correct? They were only aware of all the different drugs after I got honest about it. Right. Yeah. They had no clue before that. But the school told them. Yes. And then we went to the treatment center and. We did a questionnaire and I was basically just honest. Oh, you were? Yeah. Okay. What was the treatment centre like and what happened in treatment? Can you give me a bit of a snapshot of how that was? Yeah, so I went to a 12-step treatment facility. So that's based on the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we work through the first three steps, which are admitting, coming to believe that there's a power greater than yourself. Most people just call this God. You can call it whatever you want. It doesn't have to be a Christian or whatever religious God. Starting to kind of hand your life over to God. I did not get the God concept at all, but that we can talk about that later. And basically a day in treatment was you'd wake up in the morning. We all sat around in a circle and we started doing work, you know? So we talked about feelings And then they would have different sessions on during the day. And at some point, I would then have a session with a therapist. 
or a counselor, you could call them. And we had things, you know, from art therapy, addiction therapy. But because I was in a teenage unit, it wasn't just alcoholics and addicts. It was people with eating disorders, people who'd been kicked out of school for anger or whatever. So it was a whole multitude of things. And they were basically just trying to get us to be better human beings, I guess, you know, watch our language and things like that. And were you there willingly or did you feel forced to go? No, I was absolutely 100% there for myself. I really wanted to get sober. And I know there were students there who it was a mandatory thing that they had to do to be able to stay in school and pass high school. For me, that's not what it was. I wanted to get sober. And my parents were paying a lot of money, which was a thing in the back of my mind, you know, that they're paying all this money, make it work. Whereas a lot of other kids who were there, their health insurance was covering it or whatever. This was, you were in year 10, were you? No, I was in year 11 when I got sober because I remember I had done one year of my GCSEs. Not that great. I used to be like an A-star student and I was now down to like B's and C's. I was still passing, but it wasn't the best that I could be. When I came back to school, my school was really helpful. They gave me a bit of leeway. They kind of informed my teachers that I would need some help catching up. And yeah, I ended up getting all, I think it's 11 GCSE. So I passed everything in the end. That's brilliant. Mainly A's, yeah. There's something to be said for a school that supports somebody in your situation rather than expelling them and kicking them out. Absolutely. But having said that, I think that the student or the person, the addict needs to be willing. If they are just going to try and manipulate the system, they're not ready. Maybe expulsion is what they need to know that they've hit bottom. Mm. For me, I knew I'd hit bottom and I wanted help. And that's because you were just so thin and tired and strung out and addicted and... And unhappy. I was just really unhappy. There's this saying, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I dreaded waking up and living throughout the day. Were you ever suicidal at that time? Yeah, absolutely. But I was suicidal in the sense that I didn't want to live, but I didn't want to kill myself. Right. Yeah. So it wasn't as serious as a plan or taking action, but you'd had enough. Is that right? Yes. Right. And I used to say things all the time, like if I make it to 80 and I've never tried heroin, I want to overdose on heroin, you know, and... That's not the way I think today, (laughs) but the way I was going, I don't think I would have lasted till 80. Did the treatment work for you? Were you able to come back and stay sober? I stayed clean for about 30 days when I had my first relapse and it was a puff of weed. But the thing is, I wouldn't have relapsed if I wasn't hanging out with people who were still smoking weed. And that was the main thing. They talk about people, places, and things. And I was still hanging around with the same people, doing the same things, in the same places. I just wasn't picking up a drink or a drug. So for my first year in recovery, I was in and out, in and out, in and out of sobriety because I wasn't willing to do those 12 steps. And I made a decision. I said, right, I know that I can't use drugs and I can't drink because of what it does to me, but I don't want to do this work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just not pick up. And I did that for two years. I didn't pick up. What do you mean not pick up? I didn't pick up a drink or a drug for two years, but I hadn't fixed what was in my Uh, head. Did you follow up with AA and NA once you got back from treatment in South Africa? Yeah, I was still going to NA, but at the time the fellowship was very small. It was about two or three people. And they were a lot older than I was. I was 15 and the next youngest person was 26. I was going up there with my books and my school uniform and everyone else had financial problems or relationship issues that I just couldn't identify with. And to me, those differences were enough to not do the real work, not do the step work. After the two years of not picking up anything, but not really doing the work, what happened? Well, I was still hanging out with people who were drinking and using, and I was going out to bars and dancing, but not drinking and using. And eventually I said to myself, well, maybe I'm not really an alcoholic. Maybe I'm not really an addict. Why don't I test it out? And I just had one drink and it was fine. 
And that was proof enough for myself that I didn't have a problem. And were you still like year 12 or 13 at this point? Or was that yeah, at uni? I, was, I was over 18 because I remember being sober on my 18th birthday. Okay. So I must have been about 18 or 19. I was on my gap year. And although that first time that I drank, it was just one drink. Within a month, I was back to drinking every day. And I told myself, I'm just not going to do drugs because if I do drugs, that's a problem. And that makes me an addict. Because that was your drug of choice, not the alcohol. And I don't even like alcohol. Alcohol is fine. Everybody drinks to excess. Everybody binge drinks. Everybody gets wasted on the weekend and is hung over for a day or two at a time. Everybody that I was hanging out with, at least. And being young and a teenager, that's... But you do. We all just drink and we do stupid things that we can't remember. And I remember breaking up with someone. I, I was in a relationship and I'd broken up with the boyfriend. And I said, right, I'm going to get sober because that's going to win this person back. And you can never get sober for anyone else. You have to get sober for yourself. And I remember going up to AA meetings and not being able to stay sober. You know, I'd go up and I'd listen and I'd really believe that I was going to get sober. I even got a sponsor and everything. And I would just go back out and drink. Like I literally had no choice. I was completely powerless over alcohol, but it still wasn't bad enough. It still wasn't enough for me to actually want to do Because you weren't smoking pot and doing meth. Yeah. Because I hadn't ruined people's lives and because I wasn't stealing and because I wasn't manipulating everyone. I was still manipulating people, just not to the extent that I had been before. But my disease, my alcoholic mind just kept telling me that it wasn't bad enough. I hadn't gotten there yet. And to some degree, I could control my drinking. You know, it wasn't every day. So that for me was a justification that I didn't have a bad enough problem. But always in the back of my mind, I kind of knew that If it ever got bad, I'd probably have to go back to treatment. And about three years later, I was a second year at university. And whilst I was at university, my drinking actually wasn't that bad because I was kind of aware that if I got into a nasty situation in the UK, I could get seriously hurt. I could get mugged. I could get raped. Things could be stolen. I'd be stranded in a country where I didn't have any money or whatever or no safe places. It was when I would come back to Hong Kong to visit over the holidays that it all just... All right, because you're in a safe city, you could get home easily, you had access to money. Absolutely. Yeah. Being able to just jump in a taxi and get home or, you know, my boyfriend at the time could pay for my cab home or... It's very easy in Hong Kong to be an alcoholic. There were, you know, all the ladies nights and the two for one deals and all of that kind of stuff. And or you can buy, anyone can get alcohol Club 7-Eleven. Yeah, yeah, Club 7-Eleven. <laughs> they don't ID kids, do they? Well, I they think, didn't back then, did they? I think they must do. I think they're a lot stricter now, right. but we were all 18 at the time anyway, oh, okay, so yeah. it didn't really matter. Yeah. And men just buy you stuff here in comparison to other country. In my experience, men just buy you stuff here. And... Drunk people are very generous and will just buy and take their wallets out. Mm. So, And there's a lot of people with a lot of money in Hong Kong as well. Yes. So they don't have to be careful with their spending. Absolutely. Mm. Yes. You're in second year of uni. You're drinking heavily in Hong Kong. And then what did you do? A friend of ours had committed suicide and I just took it really, really hard but I found it very difficult to talk about how I was feeling. And it was my boyfriend at the time. It was his friend who'd committed suicide. In Hong Kong or in the UK? In Hong Kong. Right. But I was in the UK at the time. So when I flew back home, I can't really remember, but when we next saw each other, there was just sort of like this disconnect in the relationship. And a part of my addiction, I think, is that I'm very codependent on relationships. So I've always kind of had boyfriends who were bigger drinkers than I was, which made me think that my drinking wasn't that bad. And well, I can fix you or I can compare myself to you. Anyways, when his friend died, I in my head said, right, well, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to be his problem solver. And when I couldn't do that, I realized that I can't fix myself. And that's the whole reason why I'm trying to fix other people is because I don't want to look at my own stuff. That's interesting that you had that realization at that age. That's pretty young to have 
that understanding, don't you think? I think I've always been really self-analytical, but not necessarily correct. (laughs) (laughs) Aren't we all? (laughs) But I think I just always wanted to fix stuff because I wanted to be happy and I wanted everything to look shiny and neat and nice and clean. When you had this realization that you couldn't fix your boyfriend because you couldn't fix yourself, where did you go from there? I think I ended up breaking up with him one night when I was drunk and then really regretting it the next day. But he had much better boundaries than I did. And he said, well, no, we've broken up. You need to go sort yourself out. And then we can have a conversation. Flash forward to a month, I actually couldn't stop drinking. It had gotten to the point that I was so anxious to be around people without alcohol in my system. I didn't want to leave the house unless I was going to a drinking function or I knew alcohol would be there. And then one night it just got really bad. It wasn't even the worst that I'd ever done or anything like that. I just woke up the next day feeling terrible and I wanted to get help. And so I spoke to my dad and I said, look, I think my drinking has become a problem. And luckily, we could afford rehab, and I went to rehab again. Back to South Africa. Back to the same place in South Africa, but the adult unit. And this time, it was different. This time, I wanted to know about God because I had hit my emotional bottom. I just hated myself so much. And part of me wanted to get this relationship back. And when I was in treatment, I realized that this person's not coming back. I need to do it for myself. And this person is just another person. They're replaceable. And I just do this in my life. This is my pattern. I latch on to people. I hijack their lives and then I drink and then I ruin everything. Yeah. So that's funny. Repeated patterns. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't matter what country I move to or the different people I hang out with. I'm still that person who's going to do those same things. So how long were you in treatment this time? 21 days. And how was that? Was it different to when you went as a teenager? Yeah, absolutely. This time I was in happy, happy, joy, joy. When I went as a teenager, it was the first time I had ever experienced sobriety. And when I went in the second time as an adult, I knew that I actually had to put some real work in and I had to be more open-minded than I was before. I don't think anyone appreciates criticism, but I really had to look at myself and look at my part in things and stop blaming other people for why I was drinking. Is that what you were doing? Blaming your boyfriends and the breakups and things like that? Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I saw alcohol as I'm either going to celebrate with alcohol or I'm going to medicate with alcohol. You know, we bring alcohol out, you know, for fun times, but also for sad times and angry times. Everything was an excuse to drink. And that's what I think kept sending me back out. Why I couldn't put it down was because I wasn't ready to let all of those excuses go. Right. And through all that time from high school to going back to treatment at uni, was your only drug of choice alcohol? Or had yes, you, no, you I hadn't didn't, slipped back into anything else? I didn't touch any other drugs. It was just alcohol. When you came out of treatment the second time, did you go back to university? Yes. And how was that? I finished my last year of university and things were different. So I told my girlfriends who I was living with that I had been to rehab, that I couldn't drink, I couldn't be around alcohol, and they were extremely supportive. They wouldn't have pre-drinks around at our house. They would ask me if they could have a house party. They were really respectful. They were a really good, supportive group of girls. And the second I got off that plane, I went to a meeting an AA meeting. Within two weeks, I had a sponsor who was just a woman who, when she spoke, I wanted what she had. She was young. She had 10 years of sobriety. She got sober when she was in university. She talked about God really freely and easily. And that's what I wanted because I had so much religious aversion. And I just wanted to be able to believe in something. And I really liked what she had. So I would go to her house every weekend and we would read the AA literature. And she took me through the 12 steps. And that was kind of it. And through those steps, I looked at myself a lot about my behaviors, my relationships with other people. 
And to this day, I still have to go to meetings as much as possible because my mind can very easily slip back and go to, well, maybe you're not an alcoholic and maybe it wasn't that bad even now. And I have to be solid in those steps. And if I'm not reaching out to people and if I'm not being honest, then I could easily go back to a drink. And I don't think about drinking now. It's not about drinking, but it's about that alcoholic behavior that I still have of being dishonest, of being manipulative, of wanting to fix people. Those are what I act out on today, those same behaviors. And if I keep on acting out on those behaviors, one day a drink is going to seem really appealing. Right. And that's not what I want. So do you use AA to help you recognize those behaviors and change that? Absolutely. Yeah. For me, I don't think that I need anything else. You know, I know that some people have really severe depression or severe bipolar and things like that. And I think it's absolutely fine to seek outside help. And AA even says, go speak to your doctor or psychiatrist. We can't diagnose you, which I agree with. And I think that certain medications need to be had. For me personally, I can be clean and sober. I don't even like taking Panadol. (laughs) Have you been sober since that time? Yes. My sobriety date is the 2nd of September, 2013. Wow. So Congratulations. I will be five years in 2018, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Thank that's you. brilliant. Congratulations. Thank you. That's fantastic. But I've done it one day at a time. Yeah, and that's know. part of the AA philosophy, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, if I think too far into the future, it all gets messed up. Mm. If I reflect too much about the past, it all gets messed up. I need to just keep it in this 24-hour period. And have you had any other therapy alongside of going to AA meetings since you went to treatment? No, not this time. I did when I was younger, but not this time. This time I've managed to just work with a sponsor and pray to God. And that's basically been it. Great. And do the steps. And have you replaced your addictions with anything else like exercise? Absolutely. <laughs> that's what I thought. Yeah, I massively <laughs> had an exercise addiction when I first started in recovery. And did you recognize that in yourself? Oh, I knew it. I was exercising, you know, sort of two to four hours a day. And Wait. yeah, and I loved it. And I remember every time I would get upset, I'd be like, right, I need to go to the gym. But at the time, that was the lesser of two evils, you know, sure. and it's not like that today. I definitely don't exercise that much. And I had to put boundaries down on my exercise. I had to think to myself, well, how many hours have I put into AA this week rather than how many hours have I put in at the gym? And it had to be balanced. It had to be that I went to more meetings than I spent hours at the gym. Oh, and is that what you put in place for yourself? At the time, yeah, I did. Well, I spoke to my sponsor about it. She was, well, you need to set some boundaries around that. Do you feel that AA has really worked for you? Yes. Yeah. AA really has worked for me, but it's only worked for me because I've worked it. I've put myself in the center of that program and I've done those 12 steps and I've gotten the sponsor and I've continued to go to meetings. People who don't do those three things don't stay sober. Mm. They stay abstinent, but that's not sober. Have you heard of the Rational Recovery Program? I have. Do you have any thoughts on that? I don't think it would work for me because for me, I need that higher power. I need to know that I'm not in control. I'm just a passenger on the bus. I don't say, I don't define the path. I have to hand it over Mm -hmm. because the second that I start taking my will and forcing my will on things, that's when my life gets messy. That's when I feel uneasy inside myself is when I'm trying to control everything. Mm. And that's when I start acting out on other things. It's really bizarre how quickly after some prayer and some meditation, I just feel easy again. After I've kind of handed that problem out to the universe or handed that issue out to the universe, and I've just stayed still and quiet and listened, it's very easy to just let things go and like live a much peaceful and more serene life. Oh, that's really cool. It's great that it works that way for you. And some people don't need AA and they can go to church and that works for them. Some people do the rational recovery and they feel great that way and that works for them. I think whatever way you get sober and it works for you, that's amazing. I just know that AA works for me and Mm. it's been the much easier path than fighting and trying everything else. Mm. 
I'm so glad that's worked for you. What advice would you give to teenagers experimenting with drugs? Don't do drugs. (laughs) I mean, besides the obvious of please don't do drugs, be safe more than anything. Don't be stupid. And if you don't want to be doing drugs, ask for help more than anything. Just tell someone how you're feeling. I think all drugs are dangerous. Mm. Even caffeine is dangerous. Be careful. But if you have the intention that you're going to do drugs, you're going to do them anyways. Just be safe and know that if you feel like you have a problem and you don't know how to get help, there are avenues to help you. Talking about being safe, did you get yourself in situations where you were in really unsafe situations when you were young? A lot of my incidences were sort of near misses, you know, like the police would be there, but because I was so young, they kind of just disregarded us because me, I was the youngest one. You know, I was hanging out with drug dealers at their houses and the next week they got raided. You know, I never had any severe instant consequences like that. And do you think if you had that, that might've got led you to treatment or help earlier? Yeah, absolutely. But I don't know if I would have been ready. Mm is the thing. Yeah, you maybe had to get to that place where you were really just absolutely shattered before you could get the help. What advice would you have for parents who are worried about their children taking drugs or making risky choices? I think you need to speak to your kids and listen to your children and create a space for your child to feel like they can talk. If not to you, then a safe teacher, a safe therapist, you know, something safe where how they're feeling is not bad. When I was growing up, I felt like my feelings were inherently bad and that I couldn't talk about emotions and things like that. You know, I had an Asian mother who was like, don't focus on boys, focus on school. And for me, that was really detrimental because in my head that was, well, my parents don't care about what I care about and they don't love me, which isn't true. My mom just wanted the best for me, but I was a teenager. I didn't want to hear don't care about boys when I was having a fight with a boyfriend. You wanted to talk through it and have support and be able to work through your emotions and all that kind of thing. Yeah, which I don't think I had enough of growing up. And where is your life now and what are you most proud of? Like I said, I'm four years sober. I'm going five, to be, you said? I will be five oh. years. I'm not five years just yet. I'm, <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm currently four years sober. At the end of this year, I'll be five years, hopefully, God willing. And last year I gave birth to a son, a baby boy. Oh, and wonderful. so thank you. I've just spent the last year being a stay at home mom and being with him for the most part. And I really feel like my pregnancy was a god shot. I wasn't married. I'd only known my partner for a few months and I fell pregnant. And I was just, this is the way everything is supposed to be. Oh, you isn't know? that lovely? So you didn't have any question that you were going to go ahead and have the baby? The second I found out that I was pregnant, I knew there was no other option. I had oh, to have the baby. Great. Yeah. Even though other options were presented to me, I, I knew that wasn't, that wasn't going to be a thing. And are you yeah. loving being a mom? I love being a mom. I hate being a housewife. <laughs> I love being a mother. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> and what are your hopes for your son as he grows up? I just hope that he, A, isn't an addict or an alcoholic, but that more than anything, that he's just brought up in a house with love and that he can come talk to me about stuff if he wanted to. But he's just so small at the moment. I just want him to start walking more than anything else. (laughs) Yeah, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Brilliant. Sally, thank you very much for talking to me today. It's been great catching up and thank you for being so open and sharing about all your struggles with addiction. I'm sure that this is really going to be super helpful for the listeners out there. I hope it is. Thank you very much for having me. Hi, Confidants. I want to tell you about my Patreon page. I've joined Patreon in the hope of getting sponsorship for my Hong Kong Confidential podcast. Patreon is a great way for my listeners to get on board and sponsor me with monthly payments and that goes towards my production costs and rewards for my members. If you're interested in checking out my Patreon page, please go to patreon.com and search up Jules Hannaford or Hong Kong Confidential. I would really appreciate you visiting my page. So 
So that brings us to the end of another Hong Kong Confidential podcast. I'm Jules Hannaford. Thanks for joining me. And I hope you'll be with me again next week. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please can you go to iTunes to rate and review it. I would really appreciate your feedback. You can email me at jules at hongkongconfidential.net and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Hong Kong Confidential. If you'd like to hit me up on Twitter, it's at Jules Hannaford. I would love to hear from you.